Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Date in a Blank, where we're joined by Jamie Bronstein, a relationship coach, author, speaker, and host of the Love Talk Live show on LA Talk Radio. Modern dating sucks, but it doesn't have to. Here on the Date in a Blank podcast, you'll listen in on 10-minute voice-only speed dates between strangers. The experience is designed to move people beyond mindless swiping and marathon messaging. Our position on online dating? It's time to stop collecting pen pals and start, oh, I don't know, going on actual dates. Online dating? That actually involves dating? Is that even a thing anymore? But for real, dating should be fun. We hope listening in inspires you all to try new ways of meeting people. Tune in every other week to hear a new couple go on a date. In between, we'll talk to relationship experts about how the date went and what we can learn from it. Will our handpicked podcast matches find love on these blank dates? Or will they say goodbye to each other after 10 minutes and never look back? Tune in to find out. Before we jump into today's episode, here's a quick word from our sponsors. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain a bit. It's totally free, and Anchor will distribute the podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and lots of other podcasting platforms. Not only that, but it has creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. It also lets you make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make your podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. We're here on Date and a Blink today with relationship coach, therapist, and host of Love Talk Live on LA Talk Radio, Jamie Bronstein. Jamie's work empowers her clients to become aware that they were born to have love in their lives. Not just any love, the right love for them. Jamie shares her relationship advice on various media outlets, such as KTLA, Forbes, The New York Times, and People Magazine. Jamie has a BA in psychology from Boston University, a master's degree from New York University, and a certificate in spiritual psychology from the University of Santa Monica. Jamie's education and over 20 years of experience enable her to help her clients heal, seeing each challenge in life as an opportunity to evolve as an individual, to manifest love, and live life to its fullest extent. She's on a mission to create a positive impact while changing lives worldwide. Hi, Jamie. We're so excited to host you today. It's such a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, I love talking about anything that has to do with dating and relationships. So I am thrilled to be here to talk about this today. Awesome. So Jamie, in your blog, you write about how being intentional in life and especially in our relationships can make a world of difference. Can you explain a bit about what being intentional and intentional in the context of a relationship looks like and some of the benefits that can come from that? Sure. So let's just start with what I believe is the opposite of being intentional, and that would be sleeping. So I always recommend being an active participant in your life. And this is in your life and then also in your relationship. So being intentional is being intentional about your communication, about sharing how you're feeling with one another, making sure you're on the same page and being intentional about your love. You know, instead of you are surviving in your relationship, you are actually thriving and you're growing. And that's, that's the goal. That's the goal of any healthy relationship to not just get through every day, but to actually have a purpose of your relationship. So I would say that is the, the benefit of being intentional. And as a a quick follow-up question to that, with sleeping being the opposite of intentional, which is a fun kind of end of the spectrum, um, where do you kind of recommend that people might start? Because going from sleeping to totally intentional, that might be like a lot. Are there some practical things that you can recommend to somebody who's dating and trying to figure out like, okay, I've done nothing to be intentional thus far. What's the first thing that I could potentially do to start being more intentional? Okay. Well, lucky for all your listeners, <laughs> I'm writing, uh, I am writing a book about manifesting love. It's going to be published Ooh. in January, right in time for Valentine's Day. But anyway, oh, I love it. So, I mean, this would be the steps to manifesting love. And, and some of them are, first of all, it starts with loving yourself, unconditionally loving yourself and, and showing up in life authentically. So doing that work, healing your past, instead of just walking around like a chicken with its head cut off, you are (laughs) being intentional. You are doing that work to really get to know you at your heart so that you can manifest like a magnet, the right person for you. 
So that's being intentional, doing that work, doing that work to really show up as you, because through the law of attraction, you need to be showing up as you to attract a person that's aligned with that. So um, unconditionally loving yourself. Also living as if it's already happening, believing that it's going to happen and not living in fear, but living in faith and trust. Like I said, believing and also a little, little surrendering and et cetera. There's, there's a lot, I mean, this could be 12 shows. <laughs> so the, the chickens with the heads cut off. Now I'm imagining people like I live in New York. So now I'm wa- imagining walking down the sidewalk and envisioning everyone with like a, like a chicken with their head cut off. But, um, Another thing that you mentioned that I think is really interesting is really imagining that it's so already. And one thing that I did when I was leaving a career for something else, somebody told me this and I thought it was really cool. Instead of talking about wanting to do it or what I wanted to do, actually going out into the world and let's say I was at the dog park and I struck up a conversation with someone and they asked what I do, saying that I did this other thing instead of what I'm doing now and wanting to change. And basically saying, you know, oh, right now I'm doing X, Y, Z and seeing how it feels, just kind of like trying it on. And obviously in relationships, you can't just pretend like, yes, you can make up an imaginary significant other, but just kind of going through life and, um, trying it on in a slightly different way can be a really interesting way to see how you feel about that scenario. So I just thought that was a really interesting thought because I've never thought about applying that concept outside of, you know, careers or changes like that, but in the context of relationships. So maybe not exactly parallel, but just an interesting thought as you were speaking. Yes. And practical things that people can do. It might sound silly, but it literally works is for instance, undo both sides of your bed at night because the universe needs to know that there is room. So you're living as if that person's already there. Or if you pour yourself a glass of wine, if you set yourself, if you you're by yourself and you're eating by yourself at dinner, set your, your, your future significant other, um, a place setting or some wine. I don't know. Sounds kind of funny, but that is living as it. And and also I'm a very spiritual person. So talk to, talk to their soul, like kind of walk around and just, you know, talk to them or before you go to sleep at night, you know, how was your day? I'm not kidding. These things, <laughs> these things work. I, when you said undo both sides of the bed, I thought you meant the foot of the bed. And then I was like, why would you, somebody do that? What a monster. And then I realized that you meant both sides were human sleep. Now it, it makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, And also, I just want to give an example of living as if something that happened over the weekend, I was at a reunion for my spiritual psychology school. And it was just so wonderful to all be together because my third year of school, it was on Zoom. Anyhow, so we got to see each other in person. And apparently this this classmate of mine, this isn't about relationships, but it's it's about living as if and it's about um, success and your profession. He apparently has this company where he only hires $20,000 speakers. And so um, somebody had introduced me to him we had met in person. And they were saying, you know, Jamie would be such a great speaker. And the thing is, he just, he just hires business speakers, not necessarily relationship speakers. But um, I said, oh yeah, so I'm a $20,000 speaker. And, and then I was sitting around with some friends. I said, yes, we're actually all 50 to $80,000 speakers. So it was just, it was putting my work into practice. Um, because Did you know, he book you? Are you I, I think you should book you. He doesn't do um he doesn't hire relationship speakers, but yes. it was it felt amazing to say that because I mean I do I do charge a lot to speak, but it's not quite twenty thousand dollars yet. But I put it into existence. I love the yet part of that sentence. Yes. I feel like that's a really great segue into talking about thriving. It's not just about existing, but truly thriving. And one of the things that you define that as is to operate to the best of your ability on all cylinders for body, mind, and spirit. So what is some advice that you have for finding balance between all three of these things? And more specifically, what might that look like in a relationship, whether it's the relationship with yourself as you're trying to find a partner or with you know your long-term partner? I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah. So thriving is when body, mind, spirit, it, you are, you're kind of all on, I would say vibrating high, you know, like there's like low, when you you are in a low vibration, it's depression, let's just say. And so vibrating high, everything is going well. And balance is such a great word because there's this outward balance in life, like work life, home life, but then there's also this inward 
balance. Like you don't just want to be a cerebral person without being in touch with your heart, let's say. So that would not be a balanced and thriving individual. If you never work out, but you're such a feeler and you're such a thinker, your body is, it's just not optimal, you know? So to thrive altogether, I would recommend moving your body, feeling your feelings and allowing your thoughts to flow no matter what. And I have a whole thing on fear, um, the ego, our mind, you know, some people have unwanted thoughts and, and there's that negative voice. And I do a lot of work with my clients on getting a hold of that, just inviting it in and say, thank you for showing up, but I got this. And so it's thriving is also taking hold, taking control back from that negative voice. So it's having a healthy mind, body, soul, spirit. The negative voice that really, I feel like we all listen to that negative voice maybe a little too much. So I really like the idea of taking things back from it. Yeah. Yeah. I always say you, um, kindly say to your ego, I drive the boss of my life. You don't run the show. And what you do, just a simple thing is when you feel like it's taking over way too much, you just need to get quiet and you drop down into your heart because your heart is your authentic self. That's where your authentic self and your soul, who's the real you, is located. Oh, I love that so much. It's, I don't know why, but for some reason I'm coming up with the mental imagery and I'm I'm sure you've heard this before where there's this phrase about emotions where it's like emotions are kind of like having kids in the car. You're not going to let them drive the car, but you're also not going to put them in the trunk. (laughs) (laughs) You can't, can't, you can't do that. (laughs) Unless you had one of those old station wagons and the trunk is just the back seat. You just have a bench seat in it. I may be dating myself a little bit. (laughs) For any listeners, I'm totally kidding. (laughs) And sometimes it's hard to shut them up, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to shut up that voice. It's, it can be almost impossible unless you're meditating, let's say. But even during meditation, that voice, it's called, in yoga, it's called the, the chitta, C-I-T-T-A. It's that chatter. And But the more that you do invite it in, instead of resisting it and pushing it away, the more you can befriend it, let's say, and have a little convo and say what I said before, which is um, you don't run the show. Um, false. Fear is false evidence appearing real. That's Catherine, um, Katie. Oh my God. Katie Byron. Byron Katie. <laughs> she, she made that acronym. Um, and that's what the, that's what our egos spew out fear based thoughts and lies. I'm thinking now of that movie was that Pixar movie. Oh, crap. What was it? Where <gasps> each, Insight. Became, yes. Inside. Right. What was it called? I think insight out, maybe. I don't remember. Insight out. Yes, yes, yes. Where all the little portions of the personality had like an actual character in the little girl's head. And you see how they all play out and interact with each other and the ways that, you know, different things can trigger one or another and and how you can kind of, I don't know. It just, it it really is making me think of that movie. Um, So maybe I'm just visualizing everything today because I also thought about the chickens with the heads cut off. (laughs) Good. You're a visualizer. (laughs) Great. Um, so I have another question for you. So you make a distinction between unhealthy infatuation and crushes, and I'm sure many of us, if not all of us have experienced both. And I'm wondering if you, um, have any thoughts on how we can identify which of the two we're experiencing and what we should do if we find ourselves slipping into the territory of unhealthy infatuation. Yeah. So unhealthy infatuation, the, the key to knowing that is if it's 100% just not reciprocated, (laughs) you know, just, you got to ask yourself, am I, I think the problem is people don't, they'll ask themselves, but give themselves the wrong answer. (gasps) They can rationalize. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so an unhealthy infatuation is let's say stalking, whether it's like literally stalking or, um, just focusing so much, let's say on social media, just constantly looking at this person's what they're doing with their life. And so basically it's an unhealthy infatuation. Like like I said, if you're not getting anything in return, like you're this little puppy dog, that's like, please, please, please love me, love me, please. And nothing. Although if you see a cute puppy dog, of course you're going to love it. So (laughs) I think just the the visual. All over it. 
the the image of that puppy dog just being like, play with me, play with me. Um, and then healthy crush is, you know what you, it just feels good and you're open to it not working out. That's the other thing. If you have an unhealthy infatuation, you're so focused on like this person being the only possibility in your whole life ever. So that also makes it unhealthy because spiritually you want to tell the universe that I believe in abundance. There are endless opportunities for me. If it's not this one, it'll be somebody else. So that's a, that's a healthy crush. And also with a healthy crush, usually there is a healthy crush would have like, you're getting some feedback and, and the person is liking you back also, whether it's going to be turned into a relationship or not. I'm really digging this concept of abundance. And I think that that's something a lot of daters in today's day and age don't think about. I think there's such a scarcity mindset and there's an illusion of abundance that people tap into and a false sense of progress with those illusions that we have. Cause like, for example, if you're just on a dating app and you're just swiping endlessly on 20,000 profiles, it feels like there's a sense of abundance, but there's also a weird sense of, I think, desperation in that as well. Not for everybody, but depending on the headspace that you're in, where there's this, I think, interesting juxtaposition between, I hope this person is my person and I'm going to opt out of all these, you know, 20,000 profiles that I'm swiping through. So there's just like this really interesting, I think, behavior that people are experiencing in today's day and age where there's Yeah, just those two things, but they're not like true abundance, right? It's not coming at it from this perspective of like truly feeling that way. And so kind of shifting gears a teensy bit, I think one of the more challenging things about infatuation is that it feels so real. You know, each person that you're going on a date with and each person that you're, you know, swiping on or making those connections with, and it can really be quite consuming And crazy as it may be, the unhealthy infatuation can feel a lot like what people might think is love. And so is there any way to walk back from unhealthy infatuation and create a better, healthier space to inhabit? Or should whatever it is that's sparking that infatuation be left behind altogether? So, well, time, well, time is amazing Um, because it will, time will tell. You know, I would say do... Look at it as an experiment, you know, if you're feeling these big feelings, infatuation feelings, yeah, allow yourself to feel that way because it, you haven't determined yet, is it a crush or an unhealthy infatuation? Only time will tell and your dates, behavior and words and everything and actions will determine, you know, the course of, of this relationship, what's going to happen. So just once again, answer always is to be flexible and be open and not super uber focused that it has to be this one person. And I write about that in my book because so the universe gives us what we focus on, which means that you might think that if you're focused on one person, then you're actually going to manifest that because you're so focused, but it's actually the opposite because along with focusing so much on one person is actually the fear that it's not going to work out. So that's actually what you're focusing on and that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's why you need to focus on, I trust that if this is supposed to work out, it will. And if it doesn't, there will be the right person for me. And then you could add in a spiritual phrase for the highest good of all concerned. That's such a beautiful way to think about it. And I think you're right. Like oftentimes people do focus on that, the one person and they focus on all the things that work or don't work with that one person instead of like, you know, taking that step back and just saying, this is an exploration and, you know, I'm going to continue getting to know them. They're going to continue getting to know me. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, then I'll move on to the next person and start getting to know them. I think we just get so wrapped up in the concept of the one and we're constantly hunting for the one that we, we get lost in it. Um, and I think you're right. Like we, we, I think there is a lot of fear wrapped up in our search for that person. Um, So I I do like that perspective of, you know, approaching it from a different angle. So, yeah, you can't have 
this fear. It's so interesting. Once you just surrender, then your person comes in, into your life. And a little nugget, and I don't know if this is going to resonate or really make sense with everybody in, in the way that I'm going to try to articulate it. But this came to me, I don't know, within the past year or so. And it's the concept that your soulmate is a fact. Like It is a fact that you came to this world to be with this person and they came to this world to be with you. So it takes the weight and the pressure off of your shoulders. So many times people... They, they suffer. They make themselves crazy. Should I be with this person? Should I not be with this person? I don't know. And then if it doesn't feel right, it's just not your person or, oh, I wish this would have worked out. And if you just look at it as it is a fact that like my soulmate is somewhere. So it just takes off this fear and this pressure and this anxiety because it, and it's like, if it doesn't work out, it's also. It means you're one step closer to finding that soulmate because you've ruled out one more person. I love that. Yes. And thank the universe for protecting you because right. the universe has your back. Yes. One last person. Um, yes. To, to wonder if it's that person. That's good. So, you know, some of what you're, you're sharing kind of goes a lot to intuition, inner senses, like the spirituality that you mentioned earlier. So, you know, it's something that not everyone necessarily has paid much attention to in their own lives, their own inner compass, their intuition. And so I'm curious if you have any advice for folks who want to become more in touch with their uh, inner compass, any suggestions as to how they can start paying more attention to that intuition. Email me and we can set up a point. (laughs) Step Um, one. So this is my favorite topic and it's probably because it's been the most transformational for me, life changing. I've always been an intuitive person. I'm a Pisces and I attribute it to that. I don't know. Um, But once I started literally studying intuition and strengthening my intuitive muscle, which is what I help people do, it's just life changing. It's being in your integrity, which is doing what you know is right for you, which you are the expert of yourself. So no one, your aunt, your best friend, your mom, like nobody else knows you better and know what's better for you. Now, a lot of people come to me and they, they're confused about, well, I don't know. Is it, is it fear or is it my intuition? And so if it's fear, if you're feeling fear, that's not, that's just a no. Any type of fear is a no. If you have to talk yourself into something, that's a no. A yes is this feels amazing. This feels aligned. And until you have that feeling, everything else is going to be settling. What happens for those in between? Because sometimes it's not a hell yes or a hell no. It's just a, I don't, I don't know. Where, yeah, where, can, how do you handle those scenarios? Well, that can happen. And I call this, you just haven't gotten your clarity yet. So, because sometimes we don't, sometimes it isn't like an interim, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure. So the thing about clarity is that you can't and you shouldn't push it. Just allow, allow it to come to you because it always will. And it, no matter how long it takes, never make a decision until you have a clear yes or no. And in terms of your intuitive muscle, I always say, start small. Like if you are at a restaurant and you are that person that struggles over deciding what to get on the menu. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, some people base it on what other people are getting. Some people ask the waiter, waitress, just, and it might look silly, especially if we're on a date, but close your eyes for a second, for one second even, and just ask yourself, what am I in the mood to eat? And your answer will just be there. Our answers are always within. We just need to get quiet. For me, one thing that I have always found is, you, you know, when you you pick something and you're, you're like, no, actually, I don't want that. That like moment of choosing the wrong thing helps me realize the the right thing or the thing that I really wanted. Yeah, like they'll go around to the other people at the table and then 
Yeah. And yeah, you're like, actually, no, 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 I didn't want that one. I want this other dish that I, yeah, was, was vacillating on earlier. And the thing is, there are so many factors that go into like specifically uh, choosing what to order, but it can also be a metaphor for relationships. Because for instance, if you are trying to be healthy, maybe you really want to get the cheeseburger, but you're going to, but you are battling inside. Should I just get the salad? Mm -hmm. But this is also intuitive eating, you know? Eat what if your body is craving something. Okay, I'm not saying go eat McDonald's every day. <laughs> However, maybe your body needs that extra protein from that source. So get the cheeseburger. So just it, it is about listening to your body and your mind and yourself. Don't listen to the mind. I mean, listen to it, but then say I'm going to focus on my heart. I have a little fun fact that I want to share with y'all because I learned it over the weekend and it's blown my mind. Did you know there's a person on this planet who has eaten nothing but a Big Mac for every single meal for the last 50 years? What? I heard something about that. And they're actually hey, really? healthy. They're healthy. Yeah. It is astonishing. They're in the Guinness Book of World Records. And the guy is like, and he's not skinny as a twig, but he's not gigantic either. Um, but it was more for getting into the Guinness Book of World, World Records. It's just... It, Talking about eating a cheeseburger and you know, oh, don't get McDonald's every day reminded me of that. And I felt compelled oh, to wait, share. Does he <laughs> eat anything other than that? Or is it Not only for, that? I don't actually know the answer to that, but he has eaten McDonald's, I think, at least twice a day or at least once a day. And he's only oh, missed. Heck. Yeah, he's only missed eight days in the last um, 50 years, over 50 years now at this point. So you should put the link in the show notes. Okay. I know, right? I should, yeah, it's in the Guinness <laughs> Book of World Records. Yeah. My uh, grandma, she's 93, and she was basically, we just had this conversation recently because I try to help her. I'm like, eat cucumbers. They're good for your brain because she had like these two strokes recently. I'm like, eat avocados. So I try to help her eat healthy, but also I want her to enjoy her life, obviously. And she said, you know, Jamie, um, Betty White, who had just passed away around then, we were having this conversation. She said, I heard that her favorite food was hot dogs. It was really cute. <laughs> and she ate a lot of hot dogs and she lived till however old. And I said, Graham, yes. You know, like, and the fact that my grandma, maybe she's, I mean, she smoked a long time ago, but she's 93 and she's, she just kind of, she eats what she wants to eat, which is so wonderful. Yeah. So switching gears. I, know. <laughs> anyway, I, love, the grams, I love the grams. So speaking of kind of being in touch with one's own intuition, I'm curious, how do we extend this thread from just not how it benefits yourself, but how can it be beneficial in someone's relationships? Yes, I love it. So intuition in this sense is similar to empathy. So it's important. I feel like I just sounded like I was from the South. That was weird. Um, <laughs> Okay, empathy. So it's important to to tap into as best as you can to what the other person is feeling. And so if you are not, not necessarily the most intuitive person, just focus on your empathy. How would this make the other person feel if you're, you know, going to be communicating with something or just getting a sense of picking up on how this other person is is feeling like, let's say you're with somebody who isn't the best communicator and they're in a bad mood. Instead of taking it personally, just say, Hey, what's going on? I'm here to listen. Things like that. So it's, it's just being in tune. And that is such a healthy relationship when you can be in tune with each other and you actually care. <laughs> that's, that's important. <laughs> and you actually care. That's a, a low bar, but a, a very important one. <laughs> Yeah. So transitioning to chat a little bit about Jess and Peter's date, I'm wondering if there were any moments during the date that stood out to you as being especially positive. So a few positive things were they seemed like the conversation flowed and it seemed like they had a lot in common. It seemed like they were genuinely interested in learning more about each other. So I would say those would be the positive things. And I definitely have a lot more to say about the date. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't, now I want to know uh, if there's something in particular you uh, want to share in terms of your thoughts about the date. Yeah. So those are the positive things. Um, a few things that I would say stuck, that really stuck out in my mind were both of them seem to speak with a question at the end of their statement. Do you know what I'm talking about? When people oh, do like, that? Yeah. Up talk. Which shows a little 
lack of confidence. I also felt like Peter was talking a little too much. And it seemed like Jess, Jess or Jesse, Jess, Jess, was, Jess, seemed like she was asking him way more questions than he was asking her. So advice for him would, would be to, he needs to reciprocate and ask more questions. It seemed to be like all about him a little bit. And once again, for him, um, he was like, instead of name dropping, he was like money dropping kind of, I don't know. I felt like he mentioned a hundred dollars something. And then, Oh, do you go to Equinox and Equinox? And, <laughs> I don't know. It just felt like, and, and Cornell and just, I don't know. He was trying to impress her, but it's, and it's hard to do, especially if it's audio and it's not in person, but it's always better to show like show over tell and just to trust that if it's going, if it's meant to be, then they'll, he'll have the opportunity for this in-person thing eventually. But I felt like he was showing off, trying a little bit too hard. I don't know. I did notice there was a lot of a one side. There was a, it felt a little one-sided early on, but I think it just over halfway. I, I remember at some point, Peter jumped in to ask Jess questions. I was like, yes, finally. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I think there's like a component also, as you're getting to know someone of like getting into that flow and it's hard, especially in these short time frames. So um, I don't necessarily have the solution, but in my mind, what I always try to do when I'm meeting someone new is if I find myself with like talking for more than 60 seconds, just about myself to take a step back and be like, hold, hold up. Let me, let me remember something that they said and ask them about that because this shouldn't just be about me. And I know 60 seconds is sort of arbitrary, but really if we're talking about ourselves for more than 60 seconds, that's, that's already a long time, I think, but maybe that's yeah, just Yeah. And then if every question and every topic is about you, I mean, that, and that's also a good sign. I always tell my clients, if you, if you don't feel intrigued and, and drawn to ask the other person questions, that's also an indication that you might not be interested. Be interested in this, that, it was right. not that situation at all, but just in general, um, you know that you're interested and intrigued by somebody. I feel like when you want to ask them questions, but I think he was just a little nervous and trying to impress. <laughs> I think this is a good tee up to, the next question, when it comes to a 10 minute date where you aren't able to gauge somebody's body language, how might someone tap into their intuition to gauge whether or not someone would be a good fit for them? Well, voice is really big. It's, I mean, they've done, there are studies on attraction, just like there's studies about pheromones. There are studies about attraction to voices. So once again, it would just be asking yourself, does this feel comfortable? Is this fun? Does this, is this flowing? Um, and of course, sometimes it, a lot of times for most people, it can be very nerve wracking, but at the same time, when something's going to turn into a relationship, usually even the first encounter is pretty flowy. So if it feels, if it doesn't feel forced, if it feels natural, that's usually a really good indication. And even if it's audio. I love, I love that uh, you're tapping into the, some of the audio benefits because we've, we've thought and talked about that a lot. And I'm actually wondering, um, maybe in the future, we should actually ask people on our post-date survey if they were attracted to the other person's voice. Because that's it's actually something we've never asked folks. And it's an interesting question. I, what if you guys actually make a marriage from this. I know, right? <laughs> what if? We haven't yet, at least not as far as we know. But, you know, well, you just kind of, this is a new-ish podcast. Yes. I've been doing this for like 20 years. No, this is still new. <laughs> so you don't have enough data yet. Not yet. Yeah, but not. Yet. Yet is the key word. Yes. It yeah. will happen. I am sure of it. It's very exciting. We're going to be invited to that wedding for sure. I'm going to make sure of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or at least we'll have some merch for them. Right, right, right. So million dollar question, date in a blank. What did you think? Do you think that they matched and why or why not? Oh my God. Okay. So, you know, like, you know, when was this? How long ago was it? Oh gosh. Um, I'm trying to remember when we recorded their date. I want to say it was around the holidays, right? It was around the holidays, I think, because that was when we were recording most of the date episodes. So like December, maybe January. Okay, so I'm going to guess that they they took the chance and they actually went on the date. I feel like Peter was probably nervous. Again. <laughs> I always tell people, 
meet as soon as possible, whether you have seen their picture or not. Don't spend hours on the phone. Just meet as soon as possible because what matters most is that energetic connection between two people that you can't, I call it energy. Some people call it chemistry, but it's really this energy because we're all made up of energy. So I don't know what I like the idea of of energy more because I think when we say chemistry, people immediately think physical chemistry, like are there sparks? Whereas energetic connection makes it sound like there's so much, so much more and it's deeper. So I actually really like that, that kind of alternative phrase. And the cool thing about energy is that when you have a connection, it's because you see part of you in them. Like you, you see attributes, whether you are in touch with them or not. Like if this person's really confident and maybe you're not the most confident person, you might have this energetic connection with them because it's actually in you, but you haven't realized it yet. So it's so interesting. Well, Laura, do you want to make your guess? Of course I do. I definitely thought that they, I definitely thought that they were going to match uh, at a minimum because I feel like the conversation was so energetic. And one thing that I noticed is that Jess was asking a lot of questions and I've actually been kind of on the receiving end of that where someone is asking you a lot of questions and sometimes it feels really rude to ask questions back when someone is just kind of rapid fire asking you a bunch of questions. And so I think that's why for me, I felt like the conversation was pretty natural between the two of them where one person is, I think, maybe more used to asking questions. And also there's like a nervous energy of wanting to ask more questions versus being asked those questions, because there wasn't a ton of downtime where it was like an awkward silence where, you know, she was asking questions and trying to throw spaghetti at the wall. But it did feel like there was a lot of kind of energy coming. um, Yeah, just like a lot of energy coming out. And then I feel like as Tali, you were pointing out, as they got towards the middle part of the episode or uh, the middle part of the date, they really kind of hit more of a stride where there was a lot more ebb and flow between the two of them. And so I feel like because of that, I was very optimistic that they were going to continue the conversation at a minimum. So Tali, what happened? Reveal. So they did match. uh, And I also thought that they would match. They had a pretty, I thought, um, energetic conversation, even though in some places it felt like, you know, one person maybe chatted more than the other. I think it was a kind of mutually driven in that way. And, um, I, I they did end up matching, uh, and they went on in real life date. I don't think it developed past that first in real life date, but, um, they did manage to kind of meet and, and take it into the real world. Uh, so that was, that was the, the result of their blink date. I love this concept. It's like love is blind, the show. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Which I love. And yes. I just watched the ultimatum. I know. I, oh, the wait, wait. I just watched that one too. It's crazy. I didn't. I was like, this is the most bizarre concept, but watching it play out was just fascinating. But we could go on like a whole nother tangent for that. Um, we do have a few final questions for you, rather than going down the ultimatum rabbit hole. So as we wrap up, a question we like to ask all of our experts is whether you have any final words of wisdom or advice for our audience. It's going to be about intuition. <laughs> <it's my> <laughs> as it should be. Always trust yourself. Always trust yourself. Your, like I said, your answers are always within. Listen, listen to your heart. Listen to your soul. Don't listen to your mind. Listen to your heart. Listen to your soul. Listen to the feedback that your own authentic self is giving you. And it's just, it's a life changing. I mean, that's the gold. That that is the answer. To life, I would go so far as to say you will never have another regret again. Well, I want to now take that into my life with date, you know relationships and beyond. But thank you for that advice, and I will let you know how it goes if I have zero regrets ever again. Uh, <laughs> but as our, our final final question, how can our audience get connected with you? Wonderful. So my website is very easy and straightforward. It is the relationshipexpert.com, the way it sounds, etc. My Instagram, little, little different. It's the relationship expert at the relationship expert, but there's no E in the word expert. The relationship, the letter X, P E R T. Um, my email is Jamie, J A I M E, the relationship expert at Gmail. Um, I do a show called Love Talk Live on LA Talk Radio every week. All my information is on my website. And I just wanted everybody to know, I don't know if you were going to, if this is your next question, but I am offering a free gift, which if you 
email. Well, if you click on the link in the show notes, or if you email me at the email address, I just said, um, it's seven days of manifesting love affirmations and exercises. You'll get an email one each day for seven days. And, um, and then your, your person will just show up. I'm kidding. Not right away. (laughs) It gives you wonderful exercises and affirmations, um, to put this into motion, take an action take that action. And we will put all of that, um, your Instagram, your website, all of that good stuff, the free gift in our show notes. So folks, if you are listening, check it out. Wonderful. That's all we've got for you today. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at the blank date or at date in a blank to let us know what you think. If you want to try voice first speed dating from the comfort of your home, download the blank date app today. You can also sign up to participate in Date in a Blink by visiting our website at www.theblinkdate.com. In the meantime, thanks for joining us for this episode. We hope you enjoyed listening and look forward to talking with you again next time.